exception does hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome back to an episode of the Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher here with Tom, as always. Tom, how the heck are you? I'm good. I'm good. We, we, this is a good week for me. I'm excited. I'm jazzed. Yes, I know you're going to be excited about this, uh, this week's episode. This is a film, definitely, as you stated in the last episode, a personal favorite of yours. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Looking forward to talking about it with you. Oh, yeah. Before we get into that, I wanted to mention something. We did a time hop a while ago about Fire Nado. Yes. And in the Fire Nado, I mentioned one particular actor who had a very minor role. I mean, he was barely in the film. But I I referred to him as Brian Blessed ordered off of Wish. <laughs> yeah. This was a Gordon J. Millar. Well, he's on Twitter. He saw the review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And despite <laughs> despite my uh a uh, backhanded compliment, maybe? <laughs> yeah. He actually retweeted the review and commented. He says he loved the review of Fire NATO. He said it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. That's fun. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yes. He says, I love this. You guys totally get it. Thank you. Very inter- entertaining review and very funny. And he told us that he tells us that he they shot it in uh, Glencoe, Scotland. Yeah. On a super low budget. <laughs> and apparently they're having a lot of uh, really great response from the States. So I'm, I'm very happy for them. And thank you very much, Gordon, for uh, for retweeting and, and liking and understanding that it was all in fun. And we had a good time watching it and it had a good time talking about it. Yeah, no, that that that's great. Uh, you like to hear that. But it's always fun uh, if uh, anyone involved in the creative process that actually... <laughs> actually likes where we're going with this is so but that's just so cool uh, i should mention too that in his comment he he, he signed it gordon parentheses brian blessed <laughs> <laughs> other than that i have really not been up to much the last couple weeks it's been kind of just one of those weeks where what i have been watching just isn't really genre related mm-hmm. uh, i've been kind of doing a lot of sort of uh Diving into a lot of 30s and 40s, just things that pop up on Amazon Prime. So nothing, uh, nothing big, nothing serious. I, I've kind of been a little all over the map. Uh, I like, like I uh, texted you, got super excited to learn that uh, Pluto TV has launched its own uh, um, Top Gear <laughs> channel. So, and, and it's a little too all-encompassing because it includes everything after the main three left. <laughs> so, oh, really? So you get to see the Matt Smith era uh, uh, and all that, or not Matt, Matt LeBlanc? Smith, Matt LeBlanc. Uh, yeah, uh, wrong, wrong Matt. But the Matt LeBlanc, <laughs> it would have probably been better with Matt Smith. <laughs> it might have been. I, I, I watched that first season and I haven't gone back. Well, and they. They continue on even past Matt LeBlanc leaving. It, it, it is an all-encompassing. It's all British Top Gear. And uh, I, I caught some of the more recent episodes with the current crew. And they... I'm sorry. They just... They, they don't have chemistry. They, it, 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 I'm not interested in what they're saying. So, although... If you pay any attention to the socials related to uh, things going on with Jeremy Clarkson, he's not doing so well these days either. Oh no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't heard anything new. Yeah, he's on the ver. If he hasn't, it, there's rumor that he's being fired again. Oh really? Yeah. So Grand Tour may be coming to a screeching halt. Because uh-huh. the man just can't shut up about things that he doesn't really need to comment on. Gotcha. So. At any rate, regardless of the end of that, that, I've been enjoying that. But then the other thing I've gotten into is, um, based off of your recommendation, uh, you had mentioned that uh, the CW's Stargirl was actually uh, a fairly entertaining show. 
And because it's all over HBO Max, uh, I, I got a wild hair and I'm like, I wanted to see something I haven't seen before with characters I'm not familiar with, except for the fact that I know the universe they exist in. So I decided to give this a shot. I was surprised at how entertaining the show actually was. For me, that first season, you just said you went through the first season. I just, yes. and I've only seen the first season, so. Yeah, for me, a lot of it had to do with um, the chemistry between uh, Breck Bassinger mm-hmm. and Luke Wilson. Yes. The two of them together are so much fun. You can tell when they're working together, they're just, they're having a great time. If they're not, there's two of the best actors I've ever seen on television. Indeed, and, and and the progression of uh, being forced into a move with a a fairly new step parent, and the angst that that's involved with that kind of thing, uh, mm-hmm. right up to the realization that this is a person who's important in my life and I trust implicitly. That 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 growth over the se- season was actually really something. It was They did a really nice job. Yeah. And then you throw in the superhero stuff on top of it, which they managed to capture the, the, the right... Com- I thought they captured the right combination of taking an older idea, putting a little newer slant on it, but still giving it that campy, kitschy kind of feel... Like, like it's something out of the 50s. Mm-hmm. No, it is a comic book series. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's a comic book story. It is. Uh, and, and, I, and yes, I'm aware. These are comic book characters. But it does. It, it unfolds very much like you're reading a, a story arc through a comic series it, from episode right. to episode. It's just, it was. It was so much fun. And it had a very cinematic quality to it. The, the budget that went into this thing, the effects and everything, uh, Stargirl with, her, with the staff, and it, none of it feels cheap. No, it doesn't feel cheap. Uh, right down to you get to the end of the, the first season and, and she's taking out the bad guy's uh, uh, giant machine. Um, and even though it, it's done, the old villain trope where they're building everything literally under the feet of normal everyday citizens and, and and the ground opens up and here comes the big giant machine coming out of it. Very cartoony, very comic booky, but they still managed to do it in a way that it just looked really cool. Yes. <laughs> so I was pleasantly surprised, but I now I find myself on that that precipice, they did such a good job with the first season and it ended on such a good, in a good spot. I'm almost afraid to jump into the second season because I don't <laughs> want it ruined. <laughs> yeah, I'd be curious if you continue on. I'll be curious to see what you think of the second season. Yeah. I don't want to color it in one way or the other, so I'll, I'll let you decide whether you want to jump in and, and watch it and then I'll, I'm curious to see what you could come up with yeah i kind of want to discover it uh, i'll probably get it into it shortly but uh but yeah I, I, it, it ended so well that i didn't i just don't want it to get ruined <laughs> so don't leave, leave it there all right no nope, fair enough no i'm glad you enjoyed it and especially since i mean i did sort of recommend it you did so yes. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you liked it. it it is a very strong cast it's some good acting as I said, uh, uh, Breck Bassinger and Luke Wilson is a lot of, are a lot of fun together. They are. Uh, Amy Smart is in it, plays uh, the, the mom. I, I'm a fan of Amy Smart. Yes, no, I love Amy so, Smart. So, yes. <laughs> she also is just wonderful. While being very tongue-in-cheek about what it was doing, it still took its material seriously. Like, there, at no point is everybody kind of... While it had that down home nineteen fifties comfortable American feel to it, um, almost cliche in, in the way that it did it, it in, it added in tropes from today, things that we're worried about today, um, 
without beating you over the head with them and all that. It made it it made it fun and even when it hit something a little darker, a little more real, um, it did it in a way that you could absorb what they were trying to say and then not let it overwhelm the rest of the story. Like they 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 covered thoughts on uh, um, there's literally a, a a girl who has been shamed for for uh, taking nude photos uh, for mm, a boyfriend mm-hmm. and. That could just hit all sorts of ugly. And the way that it's handled, it's handled in a way that, yes, you get, you latch on to the seriousness of the the topic, but without letting it overwhelm the fact that this is supposed to just be a fun, lighthearted series. Right. So really, uh, I, I was very pleasantly surprised because I'm not a big CW fan. Yeah, no, me, uh, me either. I mean, I watched uh, Supergirl. Uh, which, which, well, that one, to be fair, started on CBS mm-hmm. and then moved to CW, but we continued to watch it on the CW. And I think that's about it. I've dipped my toes into, um, oh, what's one with the time traveling ship? That, that one actually bugs me. <laughs> so I, I started watching a little bit of the first season, but didn't get much further beyond than beyond that. Right. Uh, just, just, time and it was it was like yeah it was it was fine it just wasn't something that i really felt the need to hit that play button on the next episode yeah i did a lot of the arrowverse stuff and i know green arrow because they didn't call it green air but arrow um that one bugged me because it seemed like uh it was constantly trying to be a batman story only with green arrow uh because they kept even pulling in batman bad guys so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, Legends of Tomorrow. That's what I was trying to think of before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I've tried that, and then I tried The Flash. Um, and I enjoyed The Flash right up until you get to, like, third season, and you find out, oh, every season is the same season. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, and uh, Batwoman, I, I I tried. I wanted to like that a lot. Yeah. And I, I think the first season I, I enjoyed, and... Uh, well, most of the first season. Honestly, by the time we get to the end of the first season and going into the second season, I was like, yeah, I'm not I'm not with you anymore. Yeah, no. Like I said, uh, I, I, I've said this to lots of other friends about the CW. It, their, their shows, their DC-related shows, they always wanted to do something that they just never got around to doing. I think they wanted to have... A Justice League. I think they wanted to have Batman, Superman, um, and Wonder Woman, but they pussyfooted around that and made all these other characters trying to tell the same story, and it always never quite hit right. Again, don't tell me. I don't want anybody in the socials to tell me either. If I continue on with Stargirl, I hope it remains an independent story of its own kind. If they pull in the rest of the other universe... I will be completely disappointed. Well, apparently uh, this takes place on a parallel Earth to the rest of the Arrowverse, so you're not likely to see any of those folks showing up anytime soon. Oh, good. So, yeah. <laughs> and, but I, yes, I'm already aware that the that the DC universe in this case exists on multiple Earths because I've watched some of the crossovers too. So I get right. I get that they breach each other's world every once in a while. Just to help decide whether you're going to continue watching Stargirl or not, it, you know, the third season just finished and it's now officially on HBO, mm-hmm. and that is the last season. Oh, okay. Well, then at least I have a run. Yeah, exactly. So it it is something that you can and you don't have to invest a great deal of time in if you want to just sort of be a completist. Yes. <laughs> I've abandoned other seasons in the past for uh, I knew they were ending prematurely and mm. I just never bothered to watch them because I'm like, why do I want to end on a cliffhanger that I'm never going to get satisfaction on? Yeah, that's I, I'm hoping that they went into the third season knowing the third season was going to be their last because I'll be very disappointed if I actually do watch the rest of this third season. Right. <laughs> and then come up to that end and like, what? <laughs> and now I get nothing. Yay! Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. if nothing else, that series has got me a whole cast of characters that I now look forward to 
catching at like Cincinnati Comic Expo. There you go. <laughs> That'll be fun. So anything else you wanted to talk about or should we move on? I, I think we can move on. Uh, it, like you said, the, it, it, it's been a week of returning to regular world and, and we've been just a little all over the place in what we have time for. Right. So, okay, so let's take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And then we'll return. We travel to 1994 to find out what evil lurks in the hearts of men as we watch The Shadow. Tuning into Sci Fi TV. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Brent Barrett. I'm Kevin Batchelder. I'm Wendy Hembrock. The Viewer's Guide to Genre Television. Welcome everyone to a special supernatural focus bonus Hello everyone show. and welcome to The Faith Files. A family of podcasts for the genre-loving television viewer. Welcome to Saturday Bee Movie Reel. Hi everyone, welcome to The Study welcome Group. Welcome to the top genre characters of all time countdown. And tonight we're going to be talking about Game of Thrones Season 3. Find us at TuningIntoSciFiTV.com consumed by evil for as long as you can remember you've struggled against your own black heart shoot through him every man pays a price for redemption i'm not looking for redemption you have no choice but i'll teach you to use your black shadow to fight evil he became the shadow i didn't see anything i swear dump him <laughs> Who's there? Did you think you'd get away with it? Did you think I wouldn't know? Now, when the world is in danger, report. Police investigation of murder. Agent advises inquiry. Who knows what powers stir in the night? Whenever you did, it's in the past. Join me. Inside you beats a heart of darkness. I do what I do to fight back the evil inside me, but some part of it is still there, waiting. Genghis Khan conquered half of the world in his lifetime. I intend to finish the job. And when the adventure begins... Activate the bomb. Who knows where it will end? Alec Baldwin. John Lone. Penelope Ann Miller and Tim Curry. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow. The Shadow was created by magazine publishers, publishers Street and Smith and writer Walter Gibson. Originally created to be a mysterious radio show narrator, the character was developed into a distinct literary character in 1931 by Gibson. The Shadow has been adopted into comic books, comic strips, television, film serials, video games, and at least five feature films, but most famously as a radio drama. It was 1937 the official radio drama premiered with the story The Death House Rescue with Orson Welles voicing Lamont Cranston and The Shadow, in which Cranston explains he spent years studying in London, Paris, Vienna, Egypt, China, and India, learning different fields of science as well as the old mysteries that modern science has not yet rediscovered, the natural magic that modern psychology is beginning to understand, thus giving him the hypnotic power to clouds men's minds so they cannot see him. The 1994 film from Universal Pictures was directed by Russell McKay. It stars Alec Baldwin, John Lone and Penelope Ann Miller, with Peter Boyle, Ian McKellen, Jonathan Winters, and Tim Curry also appearing. After World War I, Lamont Cranston takes on the role of a ruthless drug kingpin and warlord in Tibet. The Tolku, a holy man, abducts Cranston and offers him a chance to become a force for good. Reasoning that he knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men, he could recognize and understand the criminal mind. The Tolku teaches Cranston the power to cloud men's minds so that he would appear to be invisible. Only his shadow would would remain. Returning to New York, Cranston resumes his life as a wealthy playboy by day and becomes a vigilante the shadow by night. 
often recruiting the victims of crimes he has rescued that he saves to be his eyes, ears, and assistants, including his tax, taxi-driving chauffeur, Mo, who is one of the few people who know his secret. Cranston's secret identity is endangered after meeting Margot Lane, a socialite and daughter of scientist Reinhardt Lane. When Cranston discovers that not only does his power to cloud men's mind not work on her, she can somehow read his thoughts. Meanwhile, Shiwa Khan, a powerful rogue protege of the Tolku, arrives in, the, in New York inside Genghis Khan's sarcophagus. As Khan's last descendant, Shiwan plans to fulfill his ancestors' ambitions of world domination. Using Margot's father as a tool, Khan sets about a plan to create an atomic bomb. The shadow must overcome Khan's superior mental abilities and stop his plans before Khan destroys New York City. Now, as we said, this was a favorite of yours. You saw this in the theater. Didn't you mention you went to the theater and, like, almost won, like, the Shadow Ring or something? Back in our heyday of the Thriftway era, <laughs> um, a friend got tickets to the premiere for that, and when we went and sat, they were uh, a jeweler in the area was giving away rep, uh, a replica of the ring, and somebody in the in the row right in front of me man <laughs> managed to get the ring, and that I was like, oh my god, I really wanted that. That would have been so cool. Uh, I I admit I only watched it twice before today's uh, uh, recording. <laughs> so um, no, this is. Uh, I, I I will go on record as saying this is never going to be a perfect film, but for me it is just so much fun. I never not have a good time watching this thing. Awesome. Well, you were one of the few, I guess, that went and saw it in the theater. Yeah. I was just reading it. Uh, it actually did pretty well. It debuted at number two. But it had tough competition because The Lion King opened up just prior oh, wow. to The Shadow. Yeah. And then The Mask with Jim Carrey opened shortly after The Shadow premiered. Uh, it just failed to kind of gain the momentum it needed. It grossed $32 million domestically. Uh, it got a total worldwide of $48 million, but the budget was $40 million. So it barely made its money back. Right. And this was a going to be like a uh, a tentpole for a, new, a whole film franchise. They were expecting to go with you know toys and games and clothing. Mm-hmm. They were going to go the whole nine yards, but due to that uh, that performance, that all kind of fell apart. Yeah, I I actually own a few uh, pieces of toys and. Uh, Actually, uh, to this day, I still regret because it wasn't even that long ago. It was like last year sometime I was in a, a, a store that specializes in, in, in old toys and such. And uh, they actually had the Perba. They had a replica of the knife from the shadow. And I decided to walk off without it. And ever since then, I'm like, I really should have picked that up. <laughs> The merchandise that I remember when this film came out that was like a big deal that I remember you could try to win or whatever was like a big bust of the shadow, I think. Yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, that's that's definitely what I recall. The whole uh, large nose, the red you know, the scarf with the big wide-brimmed hat. No, to this day, uh, I, I still intend at some point to put together a full costume of the shadow. <laughs> I was because I I thought you actually had done that one year for Halloween. I, I started to collect the pieces and I never quite got it all together. And interestingly enough, the cape that I originally procured for my costume I sold to your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go out on a limb and say that no longer exists. <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm pretty sure that's true, but but you know what? If he comes up with it and it's still in good shape. Let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. We'll do. <laughs> now, I remember watching this film. I don't recall seeing it in the theater. I think I missed it in the theater. Yeah. Honestly, it's 1994. It's a little fuzzy, a little hazy. <laughs> a little bit. So maybe, maybe not. But I know it, 
it's been at least that long, 94, 95. I don't recall if I've tried watching this since then. No. So this may have been the first time I've I've seen it since it probably first came to home video. I enjoy it. I I like the movie. Mm-hmm. As you say, it has its problems. Yes. And I think the problems I have with it may not be the same problems that a lot of pe- other people might have with it. I was just discussing it with my wife. She asked me, if, you know, oh, did, did you like the shadow that you're going to be talking about? I'm like, yes, but <laughs> um, I don't know who else you could have gotten at the time. Alec Baldwin, I think, looks the part. Absolutely. Absolutely. He looks the part of Lamont Cranston. I don't really feel like his acting style fits the part, though. I didn't really like him in the film. With this movie, and it is still part of what I love about this movie, he has his moments. There are some really good, amazing moments where... Because it's Alec Baldwin, it comes off just right. Uh, The scene that I think of, uh, and I always absolutely love this scene, it's after Margot Lane has attempted to uh, uh, kill the shadow, um, and she ends up staying the night in his home. And I I don't know where she gets all the clothing, but but that's beside (laughs) the point. But she's in this beautiful long negligee. She's in bed. He wakes her up the next morning. She goes on and on in the most sultry tone about this dream that she had. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, God, I dreamed. So did I. What did you dream? I was lying naked on the beach in the South Seas, and the tide was coming up over my toes. The sun was beating down. My skin was hot and cool at the same time. It was wonderful. What was yours? I dreamed I tore all the skin off my face and was somebody else underneath. You have problems. I'm aware of that. It's so cheesy, it's so over the top, it's amazing. And maybe that's kind of where I have the problem is I don't feel like he was necessarily taking the role seriously. Mm-hmm. Yes, this... The character in this film is a little campy. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be better if the people in the film weren't weren't aware of that and were trying and and took it a little bit more seriously. I just don't really feel like he was giving everything he could give. I've seen him in other things. Uh, I think about like the Hunt for Red October, yeah, with Alec Baldwin. I, that good dramatic performance. I like Alec Baldwin in that movie. I want that Alec Baldwin in this movie. I'm going to tempt you with something here. And this is part of where I guess this, I allow this to live in in a space where I love this film. Um, This is about a character uh, that that was created in the thirties. And and as we'll get into when we get into reviews, that's what a lot of people focused on is they have no idea who this character is. The shadow means nothing to most people. especially. And in 1994, anyone who would have known the shadow the first time around is in their 70s. So, mm-hmm. so, so I grant that. But what I feel when I watch this film, especially with its over-the-topness, uh, all of the art deco, uh, all of the scene and staging and all of that is I feel like they went and made this movie in the thirties. It has that feel, that old Hollywood feel where, where everybody's a little too much. Uh, the dialogue is a little too much. Uh, but because it's about a character in the thirties and the movie itself comes off like a movie made in that time period, 
it works for me. And that's where my head sits when, when I watch it is I'm like, I'm dialing. I could easily uh, trans, transfer Alec Baldwin for like Humphrey Bogart in this moment. I kind of want to watch this on a black and white TV. Kind of. <laughs> it, it would probably work really well. Yeah. That actually wouldn't be too bad. That'd be an interesting little experiment. Mm-hmm. So that's where my headspace is when I'm watching this. It's like watching an original movie. And I like it. I, I totally dig the vibe. <laughs> yeah, very cool. No, I like that. I like that take on it. Now, the cast outside of Alec Baldwin is pretty stellar. Mm-hmm. Um, although, I mean, we were just talking before we started recording about your your uh, fandom of uh, Penelope Ann Miller. Yeah. I was kind of on the fence of whether she was really right for that part either. I, I, I kind of wanted someone a little bit more glamorous. I suppose uh, I, I, when I saw her in that movie, I, I fell in love with her immediately. Uh, I, I, uh, again, I'm not going to take away. The performance, it, it, it's a little uneven. Uh, the, the, the actual rapport with Alec Baldwin... Um, it's a little, it's a little stark. It's not like I don't envision them becoming a couple, uh, but but she's she's kind of Girl Friday kind of feel half the time in there. Uh, she ends up uh, it, it, again. It's that very vibe that that old vibe. She she's there. She is window dressing partly. Uh, the th- the lines that she has to deliver have to be oh golly gee kind of stuff and, and and it comes off that way but again because I have transported myself back in time when watching this I get what that was whether that was on purpose this is a whole other matter <laughs> a little bit talk about the supporting cast I forgot how star packed this film yes, was indeed. the credits start rolling and I'm like and that he's in this mm-hmm. he's in this <laughs> he's in this i mean it just kept going uh ian mckellen in an almost thankless role yes of, of, you could could have gotten anybody <laughs> I to be reinhardt lane and you got ian mckellen this is Sir Ian McKellen, <laughs> and, and, and he is practically, uh, and, and in some cases, quite literally, sleepwalking his way through this movie. <laughs> yes, it blew my mind. Tim Curry, being Tim Curry, he's fantastic in everything he does. Don't have a problem with him. Nope. That's and honestly, I, I sound a little, maybe a little hypocritical because I want. I wanted Alec Baldwin to play it seriously, and here I am commenting on, you know, complimenting Tim Curry on being chewy, scenery, scenery chewing, and over the top that he was. Um, Jonathan Winters, yes, completely forgot that he was in this film. And he plays the police commissioner, mm-hmm. and also I think it was the uh, Lamont Cranston's uncle. Uh, playing it. Pretty straight, yes, for Jonathan Winters. Yeah, uh, he, yeah. A- any comedic asp- aspect he brings to the film is is very understated. Um, very much. It, it, it's flat, and, and, it, and it's meant to be that way. He he is supposed to be in the background, but this is actually where I will critique. Uh, I come down a little harder on it. Is you do have this star-studded cast with lots of potential, and you made a lot of them window dressing, and, and I feel like they could have gone that done a lot more with the cast that they had at hand. Peter Boyle too is uh-huh. Mo. I mean, he was again fantastic. Peter Boyle is a fantastic actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, just felt a little, a little thankless. It's like these are these are big names and you give them small parts. <laughs> it's like this it's weird. Well, and, and I f- figure at at this time this is Alec still coming up. Um True. Like th- this is I think this is I I'd have to look back at his filmography. I don't know uh the order of everything or uh if this but this has got to be like one of his first leading roles. 
Well, let me look at his film. See if I can dig up his filmography here real quick. Let's see what we got. Yeah, see, he was Adam in Beetlejuice before this, but that's but he wasn't the lead. Yeah, was that kind of his biggest? Um... Yeah. Otherwise, he, he. I mean, he's been in a ton of stuff. Oh yeah, no, he had done plenty. He'd worked a lot. Uh, I don't know how big of a role some of these things were, whether he was starring or not. So yeah, he was definitely the rising star in 1994. Oh, okay. Uh, he was Jack Ryan in 1990 in The Hunt for Red October. But again, I right. would make Sh- Sean Connery is probably the lead in that. Oh yeah, that's definitely the star. The, the Sean Connery is who's putting butts in the seat. Right. So yeah, but he was still like uh, you know kind of the the, the rising star in in 1994. Yeah, so uh, this is the one where he everything hinges on Alec Baldwin's performance. So when you have the rest of these names in there, um, for him to stand out as the shadow as Lamont Cranston, um, everybody else has got to tone it down a bit. <laughs> Despite the fact that he has worked so long and he's done so much stuff. I'm just not sure he really became like the star Alec Baldwin until like 30 rock. That seemed to really put his name on the map, even though I don't know how to, the right way to say it. He's a star. He's been acting. He's, he's been a famous uh, celebrity, but it seems like it wasn't until like the mid two thousands that or you know 2006 to 2013 is when 30 rock ran <laughs> that he really became like you know the apex i guess of alec baldwin in my head i don't know i could be completely mistaken no no no. i, I think you're onto something not until he voiced boss baby <laughs> <laughs> right but, but no what what it is is he does have that uh, um i i will never take anything away he has a voice um Alec a fantastic Baldwin, voice, yeah, it, absolutely. Alec, Alec Baldwin speaks. You listen, um, and, and but you're right. Uh, like the shadow of me thinking that the shadow is, is like his first time in a leading role. Whether that's true or not, that's that's how I remember it because he's been in everything, <laughs> but not necessarily the the lead guy, not the man out front. And this was. A movie where he had to be. I almost feel bad for saying it, but I, I feel like he was most famous for being the husband of Kim Bassinger. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's probably a little something to that. <laughs> Maybe a little? <laughs> no, but I mean, he, he, he's had a stellar career. Uh, lot, lots of good stuff, and he is a solid actor. But yeah, no, um, it would be fair to call him more of a character actor than a leading man. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. You don't necessarily make your movie because Alec Baldwin's in it. You enhance it because Alec Baldwin's in it. But he's not the guy that you usually put on the poster and say, come see the newest Alec Baldwin movie. Yeah, and as I said, 1994, I don't know who else you could have gotten to do it. I've just, you needed someone with the look of Alec Baldwin. Oh yeah, he no. had like I said, he has the look. Absolutely, uh, I can't imagine Lamont Cranston looking like anybody else other than Alec Baldwin. I, I, I don't want to start any kind of wars, but uh, especially given the shadow and who the shadow is, and, and let's face it, uh, me being a Batman fan, there is no Batman without the shadow. The shadow True. Came, came first. Um, and really kind of set the tone for what Batman became. But because of that and because of this time frame, I could have easily taken like Val Kilmer out of the Batman series and put Alec Baldwin in. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Alec Baldwin is Batman. That would have been something. I think he'd have been an excellent Bruce Wayne. Yeah. But seeing as how uh, you either got an excellent Batman or an excellent Bruce Wayne, and usually not both at the same time, um, there's something to be said for it. So, but I mean, that's the feel, that's the look, and Lamont Cranston slash The Shadow, that's it. And the thing that this leans on is I thought he was an excellent Lamont Cranston, and The Shadow is mostly makeup work. 
prosthetic nose and it's just the eyes and the shadows. And they did a really nice job with uh, filming that sort of stuff. Uh-huh. But this is where I could start picking on some of the technical, too, because as much as I love this film, uh, our very first scene with the shadow, uh, this uh, it bugs me every time I see the scene because he he's just got done having his way with the bad guys out on the bridge. Um, and his, the shadow actually appears for the first time. We're looking at the shadow standing on the bridge and it's him in his trench coat with the hat and the red scarf. And then you cut away for a second, and then he starts walking toward toward the scene of where he has just wrought his uh, his uh, his brand of justice. And now he has a cape. <laughs> there was some continuity there. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it was just the the cape was just behind his behind him and not flowing. I dare you to watch that scene a half dozen more times. <laughs> <laughs> not not come away saying the the same thing. In fact, I'm looking at the picture right now. There's no cape on that man. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> but it's one of those things that bugs me. Uh, but it still never takes away from from any of this. Uh, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just, just just thinking about the the casting again, and you were talking about uh, comparing the Batman and stuff. Mm-hmm. If this film were made today or more recently, I could see someone like Christian Bale. Mm-hmm. I I think he could uh, he might be able to work in the role. And you know, and maybe that's kind of one of the problems this film had is it was made at the wrong time. As you said, anyone who knew about the shadow from the first time was well into their their seventies. Not mm-hmm. your movie going public. No. So. While this would have been a great way to try to introduce a very classic character, the 90s really, it wasn't the time for that. I I honestly think you could have done this maybe a decade or so later when kind of retro became cooler. And I think you would actually have more fans, you know, more people that had already gone back and listened to the old radio plays and stuff like that. I think you would have had a little bit larger fan base at the ready. Perhaps. Um, not to mention, since you're talking about timing, we're talking about the time. This came after 1989's Batman. Uh, right. 1990's Darkman. Uh, you had that slew uh, of movies uh, about a dark vigilante I- imposing justice while they all have the shadow to thank for their existence, bringing in the shadow after the fact is a little too late to the party. Right. Yeah, you get all those kind of people that sit there and say, oh, it's so derivative of X, Y, and Z. I'm like, yeah, X, Y, and Z wouldn't exist without it. Right, exactly. But try explaining that to uh, the 17-year-old male audience that they're trying to actually pull in. Right. (laughs) But yeah, going back uh, to, to what I started to talk about, the uh, filming of the sort of effects, you know, when he's uh, using his uh, his power to cloud men's mind, you know, he, he, the way they, he'd sit back a little bit into the shadows uh, was actually really clever. I, mm-hmm. I think the film, if nothing else, did some pretty nifty things uh, direction-wise. Yeah. Let me uh, take this into the other character, the unnamed character, uh, and one of the reasons that I love this film so much, the music. absolutely amazing that those mo- those moments that you're talking about where he just kind of dips back into the shadow and, and lets his thoughts guide what's that 
what's happening and they hit that that bass chord that that little thunk that co- comes down and it just sets, it sets the tone gives me chills I, I i that's the nice part about being in the new home too the sound system went way up during watching it this time around so i could just be in that theater again well it was a jerry goldsmith score yes and so that you can't get much better no no he was perfect for it absolutely and, and there's not a, there's not a moment where the the music isn't setting the tone. It, 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 I, I, I tell you right now, if you took it and then it, if you tried to make this uh, uh, an old, uh, like an old, I, I keep going back to old film, like I, I like a, uh, uh, why have I forgotten? What, what did they call the movies before they had sound? The silence? <laughs> Silent picture. Thank you, God. <laughs> Feel a little stupid at the moment. Um, but no, you take it back to silent pictures and this movie would have been hacky with that kind of thing. But if you had this soundtrack and no one spoke, I'd still love it. It would, it tells the story for you as it goes through as any good, um, score does. No, absolutely. No, I agree with you. So there you go. I'm going to watch it on a black and white television with the, with only the score playing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, except for the one scene when they go into into the club. scene starts to kick in because I also know Margo's coming. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this one was it's one of those weird ones for me. I mean yeah. I like it, but it's just it's right there on that on that line for me. And, and, and for a lot of people that is where it is and which is why this fits into our theme for the year. Um it is a Beautiful film. Uh, Yeah. As I said, I think it was shot fantastic. I think it looks gorgeous. The effects, the direction are fantastic. And I don't know. Should it have launched a franchise? Uh, Maybe. I, I, again, I feel like I'm kind of on that fence between do I want to see more from these characters? And I, I feel like this is a... Yeah, not bad. Let's see what you do next time is kind of how I feel. So maybe I do. I kind of wanted to see a little bit more just to see if they could uh, they could do better. I'm actually gonna break from you on the on this as much as I would as much as I love this and this crew and, and all of this and would love to see more of it and all that. It sits as this for me. It sits as this little pearl. Um, in the mix to try to carry it on would cheapen what I have for this one unless you could manage to recapture it in some fashion no Um, that's absolutely fair because everything about this I want to live in that version of New York Mm -hmm. I mean granted it's all fake (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's all universal backlot It's all universal backlot, but that's what starts making it feel so right. It's just this over, over picture. It's a postcard. The 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 movie is a postcard to an era that didn't actually exist, like people want to think it did. (laughs) And honestly, that just takes it back to what you're saying before, where you know it feels like it was made in the '30s. 
because yeah, it's like that's how it Hollywood. Would, that's how it would have been shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I I hadn't thought about that, and I I really appreciate that that point. I I want to talk to the director and I go, did you ha- were you trying to make an old Hollywood film with an old <laughs> an old radio program character? It, is that what you were going for? If it is, genius, you hit it. And then everybody else missed it because they're too busy watching the the Tim Burton Batmans and, and all of that, and they're expecting that experience. And we went in a different direction, right? So, so let me ask you this. I mean, I I kind of hinted at if it was going to yeah. be remade, you know, more closer to today, and and who would you cast and everything. Is this a film? Is this a character? that you would want to see them try again? I would love to see... I I think there's a lot of potential in the concept of the shadow, especially given it's a character that doesn't specifically have a power. So it's still a human that has... uh, he, He has honed skills that allow him to do what he does effectively. And I think that could be a lot of fun but I don't want them to try to remake this. Uh, if they did it, I'd almost prefer they take the shadow as a concept and put him in another time. Mm. Don't try to bring me the, the 30s version uh, of the shadow again. And don't even suggest that there is a 30s shadow. Uh, rewrite the character for a more modern time. I could get on board with something like that. I think that we'd end up with the same problem that this one probably had and that people would find it derivative of the things that <laughs> derived from the the shadow. Uh, what in the world do, does anyone watch any more that isn't derivative of something else? Exactly. But the problem is they are all familiar with those things. So you see something like this and you're like, oh, this is just like Batman. Right. I, I, I get that, except, again, this is the one that is the, well, not even entirely the original. How old Zorro? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, Zorro might have predated this. Yeah. Not, not up in my Zorro history. Yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, how di- far back literature and or storytelling of any kind related to Zorro exists. Um, that would be its own good case study, but... That's just it. Uh, even characters like this, they all came from somewhere else. Yep. Zorro apparently was created in 1919. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, Zorro predates The Shadow, predates Batman, predates all, all, all of those. Yes. Um, and if you keep going back, you can get to, like, The Three Musketeers were essentially a version of this. Um, yeah. Just add a mask, right? <laughs> it, it, exactly. It, it's a. It, in that case, it's three, three slash four, um, swashbuckling individuals doing right by their own sense of moral compass. So, hey, the the tale uh, has gone on forever. Uh, go go back far enough, you might find that a cave painting has a picture of a guy in a mask <laughs> somewhere, uh, preventing. Uh, Ugh from losing his girl to Oog. <laughs> this is another movie that we got a ton of uh, comments on the social media. Would you like to hear what other people thought about this film? Absolutely, as long as they as long as they all agree with me. All right. Well, let's see what they did. Okay. Uh, over on Twitter, the Rating Room, which is a fun podcast, currently talking. Uh, they're going through all the James Bond films one at a time. Nice. Very it's really good. interesting. Lots of fun. They say, I really enjoyed this film as a kid. I remember my dad watching this film a lot. I haven't seen The Shadow in about 20 years. I'm looking forward to that episode of the Time Shifters podcast. So thank you very much. So yeah, they uh, remember liking it as a kid. On Discord, Matt, he says that I enjoy this movie. I get why others don't, but it plays overly dramatic like a 1930s radio drama would have been. I honestly think that... This is a case of people not recognizing a character, so they chose not to like it because this movie is so much like 1989's Batman. (laughs) Everyone loved that, even though it was ridiculous, but they loved it because it was Batman. So there, he was very close to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, On Reddit, the stud comic, 
Great Jerry Goldsmith score. The movie is good, too. Don't understand the complaints about it. <laughs> On Facebook, Rich Chamberlain. I have a long and nostalgic history with the Shadow Radio program, so this was a definite go-to to, uh, go to the theater moment for me. A flawed film, but a great movie-going experience. Uh, Thomas Lindemann uh, replied to that and said, From what I've been led to understand, it's as faithful to the source material as possible. The radio show does give a quick origin story during the introduction of the episodes, but there's a lot of information the audience had to fill in for itself. Now, the origin story in this film that was kind of made up for the particular, for this version of The Shadow. Sure. Uh, we never really got a real, like, and this is how it came to be in any of the radio programs. It was all, like I mentioned earlier, it was just, oh, yes, I went abroad and studied and I learned these tricks. Well, yeah, and go, pouring through some of the other history, uh, when it moved over to uh, literature, whether it be actual uh, novelization and or um, pulp fiction magazines, um, they jumbled about with uh, the origin as well, and including the name of the actual character. Right. <laughs> Uh, but still on Facebook, Brenda McNeil says she would have loved to own the contact lenses concession on that film. His <laughs> eyes change color more often than Charlton Heston's and Ben Hur. I didn't notice this. <laughs> Actually, I had read that comment prior to watching uh, one of my the times I sat through, and I totally caught it because uh, between uh, Shawan Khan and, and uh, the Shadow, uh, they were every time they were doing something mental. Their eyes changed. Oh, nice. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shawan Khan, at one point, anytime he was trying really hard to do mental tricks, uh, his eyes were as big as saucers. I mean, they were just black. Right. <laughs> so. All right. Charlie Chase says he rented this movie a lot. We even brought it up last night in the live stream about favorite VHS covers. Well, they did have some actual nice art to go along with the film. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Chris Cree says, I haven't seen it in forever, so don't remember much other than I think it kept fairly well to the comic. Well, if by comic you mean radio show or pulp or, yeah, <laughs> comic strips and everything. No. Yep. Uh, Thomas Lindemann comments again. He says, Alec Baldwin came off swarmy in the role, which detracted from its enjoyment for me. The story wasn't that good, but it had Tim Curry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd say he was swarmy. I don't know if I agree with that, but I think he's fallen a little bit onto my side about Alec Baldwin. Though. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's more of a stance on Alec. <laughs> yeah, Billy Flynn says I really wanted to like this movie. It tried so hard to keep me from liking it. It's a rather faithful adaptation of the source material. I just don't like the way it was executed. And Jonathan Winters in a dramatic role was interesting. Rodney Rod Rod Barnett. Uh, then re replied to Billy about what he says, I have always felt that I could pinpoint the problem, the film's director. Russell McKay is an Australian director that got his start in music videos and far too often it shows. McKay is in love with a constantly floating camera. If you've ever seen his 1986 film Highlander, you'll recognize the style of camera work I'm referencing. He shoots everything with the camera in motion, and while that can be sometimes be interesting, it frequently draws attention to itself in a distracting way. In the shadow, he can't seem to stop himself from nonsensically circling the actors so much that I'm surprised the cameraman didn't run into the actors or get motion sickness. It's ridiculous. <laughs> And it also draws attention to the points in the movie where bits of dialogue have been edited out, leaving a few holes that have to be ignored or papered over. Now, that was interesting because I read that before watching the film and I tried to kind of watch for it. I didn't really notice that kind of camera movement. No, I mean, the only time I can really say that I noticed that camera movement was in, in Lamont's dream where um, he pictures... Um, Margot standing and the flame shoots out of the fireplace and begins to surround her. Mm -hmm. um, and the camera does make these very weird panning things, but because it's in a dream sequence, it kind of made sense that everything's kind of floaty and constantly right. in motion. Yeah. I only, I noticed the absence of camera movement 
because I was kind of looking for it after reading that comment, because I, I, there were many moments where I thought, well, this is where he was talking, and nope, nope, camera doesn't move. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I didn't catch that. Yeah. Well, Rod Barnett continues with his own comment. He says, I won... I was one of the millions of people who was disappointed by the film when it was when it debuted in theaters in 94. As a fan of heroic pulp fiction and The Shadow in particular, I was let down by the fact that the film seemed to be a series of excellent sequences held together by a very thin story that often flew apart. At the time, I felt that the script didn't allow the overall structure of the story to take shape well enough before another big set piece came along to get the audience heart rate up again. Although across the 90s I watched the film several times, I always came away frustrated that although the movie has a number of great scenes, a wonderful cast, some good action sequences, fine period detail, and an excellent score, it just didn't gel for me. But then I revisited it a couple years ago and found myself really enjoying it. A lot. That's not to say that the irritating flawed bids were less irritating, but they took me out of the film less than in past viewings. I found myself really having fun. Even some parts that I had previously been truly irritated by were interesting. The feel of the film is about 85% right, and it looks fantastic. Maybe it is just that I was happy to see this story again after so long, but I was truly glad to be watching this movie. And I'd love to see some deleted scenes if this ever gets another fancy release. Interesting. I That's very curious. The, he had yeah. stepped away from it and came back and actually... It completely changed his mind. That is interesting. Usually I go the other way. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a more often the case. And the last comment is to, is from J.J. Jeansom. Always found this to be quite underrated, was mm -hmm. all they had to say. But again, lots of fantastic comments. Thank you, everyone, for uh, piping in and, and giving us your thoughts on the film. Appreciate it. Absolutely, shall we? Shall we hear from the experts? Yeah, what did the critics of the time have to say about The Shadow? Uh, let, let's just say the overarching theme is not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we begin uh, with um, Brian Lowry of Variety. Um, the excerpt I'll read from him says, From a box office standpoint, the more pertinent question than... Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Maybe, who knows or cares anything about the shadow? <laughs> a character whose heyday came in the, in the 30s, despite the film's visual opulence, that factor alone should prevent the shadow from covering much summer audience once those predisposed to see it have run, have run their course. So... Basically, if you liked superhero stuff, you, you went, you saw it, and they, he thinks nobody else gives a crap. <laughs> so, what, wasn't a fan. Um, picks on uh, the similarities to Batman a lot through the rest of the, uh, the treatise there. Um, then we go to New York Times. Uh, Karen James wrote, uh, I'll read this, uh, in this sleek, entertaining new movie, The Shadow is Alec Baldwin, a wily actor who brings along just the right mix of do-goodism, do-goodism, <laughs> quite, the, quite the turn of phrase there, and evil potential. Style is almost everything here, and it's a tough call whether the star is handsomer than the set's. Sumptuously designed to within an inch of its life, the film is crammed with Art Deco nightclubs, high-rise buildings, and 1930s yellow cabs. And though it includes some whizzing up-to-the-minute visual effects, the appeal of the shadow is the retro fantasy of an old-fashioned crime fighter whose followers wear rings that emit secret signals. So they, they kind of enjoyed this, but then they go on to kind of get into where it starts to fall apart for them. Um, then we go over to Entertainment Weekly, Owen Gleiberman. It's doubtful many moviegoers under 50 will have much of an idea who The Shadow is. And after sitting through The Shadow, they still won't. <laughs> <laughs> the movie has all the coherence of a bad acid flashback. <laughs> the, 
This is also the person who went on, uh, uh, I'm not going to get into the, I think they fell asleep or maybe they were in the wrong theater because they also write in here. Uh, the dagger is a nifty special effect, but our main reaction to the sequence is to note that even under terrible hippie wig, Alec Baldwin doesn't look remotely Chinese. Yeah, they didn't understand the character at all. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. Because then they go on to talk about Lamont Cranston being a tuxedo-clad playboy. And I'm like, yeah, you do know that's the same guy and he is different stages in his life, right? Right. <laughs> so, kind of missed the point. Um, at any rate, uh, and I'll wrap this up with uh, uh, my go-to guy, Roger Ebert. Um, miss, I still miss Roger because... Uh, he always entertained for that that shift between wanting to err on the side of everything artsy. I don't understand it, so it's great. Two, could I occasionally get into things that are fun. So he actually gave The Shadow three stars, which with some of our ratings from him, that's pretty high. That's very high. <laughs> yes. So uh, he says The Shadow is the kind of movie that plays better the more baggage you bring to it. If you respond to a film noir, if you like dark streets and women with scarlet lips and big fast cars with running boards, the look of this movie will work some kind of magic. He does go on to, to point out a lot of, um, there's some chemistry issues between like Alec Baldwin and Penelope Ann Miller. He's not wrong to say those things, but overall he, he kind of really enjoyed this. I love he, how he wrapped this up. The Shadow was created during the Depression, when the mean streets were dark and threatening, and it was comforting that there was a denizen of the night who fought for good, not evil. It still is. That, that's how he ended the... the he kind of was more into this than I think he even let his, his, his review say, because he started getting a little flighty in this. Yeah. <laughs> That was fun. But yeah, for the most part, the uh, the reviewers of the day pan the hell out of this movie. Well, as we uh, as you alluded to earlier, it looked pretty. <laughs> it did look pretty and it and it's it's not for everyone. It does have its flaws, but I think if you look at this it, in the right light, and it doesn't take it, it. It's not rocket science to look at it. If you think of it more as an old Hollywood film, I think you can get into this a lot more if you even like that. If right. you can put yourself in the headspace where you like the kind of over the top old, uh, the dialogue is campy, the the everything's more dramatic than it probably actually is. You can get on board with this. It comes with a recommendation, I think, from both of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also go ahead and throw a recommendation. Go to someplace like archive.org and dig up some of the old radio plays. Sure. And give Absolutely. those a listen. They, they can actually be a lot of fun as well. If you can dig up the old pulps, those are a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, um, I've not read any. I have actually not read any of the pulps. I would be very curious to, to read that myself. The pulps are cool, uh, and the character survives to this day. Uh, he still makes appearances in a number of uh, comics. Uh, Dynamite Comics ran an entire The Shadow series for a long time, not that long ago, and he finds himself crossing over with others. Uh, uh, there, I'm actually sitting on a, a batch of Batman comics that are actually... The, the Shadow and Batman. Together. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to actually reading through those. They're a little dated at this point, at this stage as we're discussing it, but I've been sitting on them for a while. <laughs> I need to read them. Yeah. All right, very cool. Yeah, well, if you if, if and when you do, you'll have to let us know how, how they are. Absolutely. And if anyone's got a cape handy and a wide-brim hat, I'm in, I'm in the market. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Well, that's going to do it for The Shadow. In a couple weeks, we'll we be back with... Uh, we're staying in the 90s. We're just jumping one year ahead. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the Kevin Costner epic Waterworld from 1995. This should be interesting because, as we were discussing before we started recording, I've never seen all of this 
all the way through. And, and I don't believe I have either. I'm familiar with a lot of the film, but I don't think I've done a sitting where I watched beginning to end. But this is another very big budget, very lavishly shot. And if I remember correctly, kind of panned. <laughs> so we'll see if this film, if there's something to this film or if it is truly all wet. Well, and as I understand it, uh, Mr. Costner actually funded a great deal of this film to get it made. And quite frankly, sir, if you're out there listening, uh, I can be bought. So <laughs> if you want to continue to contribute to uh, your Waterworld uh, money pit, I'm here for you, man. That will do it for this week, <laughs> for this episode. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you have any additional comments or you want to reply to anything that you heard uh, that uh, Tom and I said or any the, everybody that, that we read uh, here on the air, go ahead and go to the social, follow the link to the, all the social media sites, leave some additional comments, or send us an email to timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. With that, I will just say... <laughs> Crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. <laughs>